Uh, I welcome you all on behalf of DST Foundation, and it has been such a nice opportunity to speak to such a lovely audience. I'm Dr. Abida Zahoor. I have done my MBBS from Khyber Medical College Peshawar and MCPS from CPSP. And uh, last year I have done my MRCUG and MRCPI. We are here today to discuss about urinary retention and our main focus is in pregnant and postpartum women. So let us start with it. There is no consensus or definition about the urinary retention, but guidelines and International Society of Incontinence, they agree that urinary retention, it is actually the inability to generate or to void spontaneously. And it is more common in males as compared to females. And studies have shown that male 11% presents more than the females. So if we look for the causes of urinary obstruction in males, they are obstructive. But in females, in the acute presentation in the pregnancy and postpartum period, usually the causes, they are non-obstructive causes. So what is the obstructive causes? Obstructive causes are those in which usually there is some obstruction in the neck of the bladder or urethra, and they are causing obstruction. We have also causes other than obstruction, which can be like neurogenic causes like the bladder, it is being distended and the sensation to void has been lost. So it can also present as urinary retention. But as far as in females who are pregnant and the postpartum period, they do not present with the obstructive causes. There is other causes like chronic due to drugs, especially the anticholinergic drugs, pelvic organ prolapse in the females in the form of cystocele and rectocele, they can also cause um, obstruction and they can lead to uh, retention in the females. While diabetes mellitus, which causes the neurogenic bladder can also lead to urinary retention. But these all conditions, they are rare in acute setting of urinary retention in pregnancy and postpartum period. So if we look for the causes of acute urinary retention and the chronic urinary retention, the acute urinary retention, it has acute presentation. So the patient has acute distension and in pain, while in chronic urinary retention, they will be presenting with the symptoms of urinary problems, like they will have hesitancy, uh, incomplete widens of urine, and problem with the urinary stream. Now coming to the prevalence and the risk factors. We should always keep in mind that in pregnancy and in the postpartum period, the women, they can present with urinary retention without any underlying cause. But still, we have to look for the risk factors which can be the presenting. So how we will <clears throat> defined as the postpartum urinary retention. It is a common postpartum complication in which the women, they are unable to urinate and it is characterized by dysuria or incomplete in ability to void urine after delivery. And it can present in about 12.4 to 24% of the females. So from the percentage which has been uh, recently coded in the talk article, May 2022, it is a quite high percentage, 12.4 to 24. So this problem, typically it should be addressed in the setting of the hospital as well as community in where the women, they are being neglected. And they may also not know that they are at risk and they can have this life-threatening situation after delivery or during pregnancy. Postpartum urinary retention, it can not only cause acute problems to the female like pain, distension, inability to void, but it can subsequently damage the muscles of the bladder and it can lead into the damage and voiding dysfunction. Postpartum urinary retention, it also increases with the recurrent urinary tract infection, which can occur in pregnancy and it is more frequent and it can also lead into persistent urinary retention and subsequently it can affect the quality of life of a female. Now generally coming to our patients who have the risk factors for urinary retention are the women who are in their first pregnancy, the primary Paris women. The women who are taking epidural analgesia, 
which differs from community to community. In, uh, in developed communities, epidural analgesia, it is common and we are ruling the, it uh, uh, as of cause. But uh, in underdeveloped under under countries, of course, of course the the and it will be a big issue for forceps, but typically it is more common with the forceps delivery. The other cause can be the vaginal or perennial trauma. And also the duration of labor is an important factor for the urinary retention in the females. Nay. Now, uh, which stage of the labor it has more impact on urinary retention? So in, in our mind, it will come that the second stage of labor, it may be more notorious if it is prolonged two to three hours or more than three to four hours. But the duration of labor not only counts for the second stage, but it is also important in the first stage. Now, now like if the first stage of labor, it is prolonged, it can still cause edema in the bladder wall. It can cause edema in the lower uterine segment, compressing upon the bladder and causing problem with postpartum urinary retention. And also the woman who has poor or neglected bladder care in labor, they are also at risk of developing postpartum urinary retention, which can be more common in our community. So the proper labor monitoring and labor guideline, they are very important from every unit or every setting or every community to follow in order to avoid this life-threatening or condition in the uh, pregnant woman as well as in the postpartum woman. And of course, the neonatal birth weight and the female itself, the mother uh, weight, it is important risk factor for the postpartum urinary retention. So if we go like here in this uh, photo, the postpartum urinary retention, just uh, we'll revise that it is due to the instrument, vacuum and forceps, both any trauma in the reproductive tract, it can be in the uterus, it can be in the cervix, in the vagina, and also in the perineum, excessive weight of the mother. If the woman, she has persistent incontinence or some urinary uh, symptoms from before, if she has multiple gestation, or if the patient, she has the same problem pre during previous pregnancy or the same pregnancy or during postpartum previously. Now, what is the urinary retention? According to the International Continent Society, the inability to void spontaneously, and there is no fixed duration because this urinary retention can be acute or it can be chronic or it can be in the form of overt or covert. But the guidelines, they agree for the urinary retention in the postpartum woman as overt postpartum and covert postpartum urinary retention. And they have given certain time limit in these women. So what is overt postpartum? It is the urinary retention, which refers to the absence of spontaneous micturation within six hours or we can extend it up to six to eight hours of vaginal delivery or within six to eight hours following the removal of an indwelling catheter after cesarean section or epidural anesthesia. Now, what is the covert postpartum urinary retention? There is no typical like sudden urinary retention and the woman would be unable to void, but there will be problems in the stream. There will be problems to initiate or there will be some bladder distension or some weakness in the pelvic floor muscles, which will lead into increased residual volume. So the women don't have a good stream, a good sensation, such that the covert postpartum urinary retention will be presenting with post void residual volume of greater than or equal to 150 ml after a spontaneous maturation, which is confirmed on the bladder ultrasound scan or catheterization. So when we are measuring the residual volume, the guidelines, they recommend the ultrasound scan because it is more acceptable and less painful for the woman. But in certain communities, ultrasound scan may not be available and we have to solely depend upon an in and out catheter to measure the amount of the post wide residual volume. <clears throat> now, this was the postpartum urinary retention in postpartum period. Women, they do present with urinary retention during pregnancy and in which type of population or pregnant woman, the postpartum urinary retention is common. Like if the woman, she has urinary infections, which is more common and recurrent in pregnancy, 
she can be prone to urinary retention, but it is less likely. And similarly, if she's on medications like anticholinergic drugs, she can present, but this is very rare and uncommon. The most common cause of the urinary retention during pregnancy is the retroverted uterus. What is a retroverted uterus? You can see here in the diagram. The first diagram shows the normal antiverted uterus. This is the uterus and bladder and it is angulating over the uh, bladder. So this is the normal uh, presentation. Now the retroverted uterus, it is retroverted back towards the rectum. And if it is fixed in the third diagram, it is showing the fixed retroverted uterus. So the retroverted uterus is the most common cause of the post, uh, urinary retention during pregnant women. And especially in fixed retroverted uterus, 20% of the women in early pregnancy between 14 to 18 weeks will present here. Now let us come and see what happens actually. Here actually this uterus, when it is growing up, it stretches back and this fixed uh, form structure cervix, it is compressed upon the bladder outlet or urethra and it causes obstruction. What happens that in this situation, the woman will also present with acute retention. We have to relieve her retention and she may need an indwelling catheter or intermittent catheter, but it usually resolves when the pregnancy advances and the uterus, it goes outside from the pelvis and this pressure is automatically relieved. This is the ultrasound presentation of the urinary retention during pregnancy, early pregnancy due to a retroverted uterus. So we can see it also in ultrasound presentation. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of urinary retention? If we come to the chronic urinary retention, this is not our domain. In pregnant and postpartum women, typically there will be acute setting. So we will not have this problems of inability to completely empty her bladder when she's urinating or the frequency problems or difficulty in initiating the urine, which is called as hesitancy or the slow urine stream. But these are all the problems which we can find in the chronic uh, urinary retention. Here or woman, she would be unable to void the urine A at all and she will need an urgent help. So it will present in a form of emergency. Those gynecologists who are working in the emergency, they usually come against the urinary retention in the emergency. And really the women who are presenting are really in agony and they need help. And they need to be properly diagnosed at the spot and helped with. So it is typically the pain over the bladder and difficulty at all to initiate the stream or if they will generate, it will be a weak stream with a dribbling and there is, will be a leg to urge to urinate despite of a distended bladder. And sometimes, and also we have seen a woman in the neglected community that they are coming with a bladder which is up to distended up to the epigastrium. Really, it is a difficult situation for the postpartum woman. And sometimes these women, they can have frequent small amount of urination and they will have nocturia that is the widening of urine more than two times at night and they will be continuously dribbling or they will have some incontinence. They will be wetting themselves before they reach to the washroom. So further, uh, these women, we, we know that despite of the full bladder, they will be unable to urinate. But the main important thing is the severe pain. And it can be life-threatening if it is not diagnosed, in, especially in the neglected communities. The women will have a neurogenic bladder, distended bladder. There can be damage to the kidneys. And in certain communities, uh, especially I myself have seen the women, they are presenting with renal acute renal failure as well. So always, always, when we are coming with the patients who are pregnant, especially, we have to tell them about the bladder care and especially postpartum women who has come too far from the communities to us about the bladder care and the warning signs of urinary retention and they have to present as emergency. They have to seek for urgent medical help. So if the woman, she present to us, like we no, don't need to take a detailed history. We have to come across her symptom first. We have to offer her analgesia and support, and we have to relieve her retention. We have to catheterize her. And after being relieve her agony, we have to go to a detailed history and examination and investigation.
Now coming to the history, why the history is important? Because the history is important because we have to elicit the risk factors. So we anticipate the risk factors. So then we can reach to the proper diagnosis and the next step which we have to take and some advices for the patient also to take home. Now in the examination, we have the journal physical examination, of course, her vital temperature, her SpO2, all. Maybe the patient is in sepsis and with acute renal failure in neglected communities only. And also to further palpate her abdomen, that to which extent she has distension, is there any masses, anything? Because sometimes in a woman who is postpartum and she's with fibroids, so this can also cause the urinary retention in these women. And also we have to check for the perineum if she has risk factors like she was having forceps delivery, instrumental delivery, prolonged labor. So we have to check the perineum, there is trauma, and we have to address it or any hematoma. So these all are important. And in some uh, multi-paris women, we have to check for the pelvic muscle tone, which is also important. So our examination for a woman, it will be different according to the risk factor as elicited by her history. And then of course, we have to come to the investigation and the first step of investigation will be the urine analysis and culture. So in order to treat and in investigate and treat to know about any under, uh, underlying infection and to treat it promptly. So this will have a complete set of journal physical examination, abdominal examination, pelvic floor muscle tone and all, and a full set of investigation. So this is very important in this setting. Now, what questions we will ask in the setting of urinary retention for any woman who is postpartum, who is pregnant, or who is generally presenting to us community is the voiding problems. So there is a new set of VC questions which are being recommended by the RCG TOG article May 2022 that you have to ask about the VC questions where the V stands for volume. So about her volume, E is about empty, emptying of the bladder, S is for sensation, S is for stream, and I is for incontinence. So if we keep this in mind, we would be able to ask for all the problems which are related to the urinary flow. So regarding the we, do you pass a good volume of urine? So the woman will tell you how is her volume. Maybe she is voiding small amounts only. Then in like it depends upon community. To, if you are sitting in Pakistan in any community and you have to ask, so the woman will tell you in glasses. She will not be able to ask tell you about mLs. She voided about fifty mL, hundred mL. So this is from community to community. She will tell you about the volume. So you have to elicit about the good volume of urine. Then secondly, coming to did you uh, did you feel your bladder is empty at the end. So the woman with this problem, she will say she don't have the complete sensation of being empty the bladder. Then S stands for sensation. Do you have a sensation that you want to pass urine? Maybe she doesn't have any sensation or she has this sensation, a loss of sensation from before. So you will come to the chronic cause which can also contribute further to the retention. Then about the stream. So it is also important if she is uh, having slow stream, poor stream. So it is also telling us more. And finally, is it stated with any incontinence? She is able to reach to the washroom, or she is wetting herself, or she is wetting um, her bed. So it is all important questions regarding the urinary problems in the woman. As we told that the urinary retention in any setting, in hospital or community setting is a medical emergency. We have to treat it as emergency and provide the general measures and support to the patient is very, very important. What we have seen, like uh, mostly support to the patient is lacking. The patient would not be able to know through which distress, through which phase she's passing and she would be unable and, uh, to understand her situation. So general measures include the patient's support of, as an utmost important thing. Then providing the appropriate analgesia. If the woman, she's constipated, she won't feel relaxed at the pelvis. So we need to avoid the constipation by aiding on laxatives, by telling our patient to take more water and to feel relaxed while she's voiding or she's defecating. And also, like we should have enough nursing care or support or someone with the patient to encourage her to walk 
calmly to the washroom and it can aid further to relieve her urinary retention. And any woman who delivered or who has been removed the Foley's catheter after the cesarean section or, constip, uh, or the epidural analgesia, she should be asked to wait or try to wait within four hours. And a further two hours can be given in total. So the guidelines and the International Continental Society, they agree on this plan that they should be encouraged to wait and a cutoff of six hours should be given. And when they wait, we have to document the voided volume. So it is very important to document the voided volume. So also we should have patient information leaflets and we should tell the patient how she will feel relaxed when she will go to washroom and what factors will further aid her to void the urine. So this is the toileting position of passing urine and opening properly the bowels for a woman who is having urinary retention. So first of all, as you can see here, we have to tell her to either step up her feet, like here, come up onto the balls of your feet if comfortable. If she is not feeling comfortable with the stretch out feet, she can place a small stool below her feet in order to raise it just above the levels of the ground. So it is further adding relaxation to the pelvic floor. Then to lean forward her hips, lean through your forearms onto your thighs. And during this procedure, do not hold your breath or don't strain because it will increase the retention more. We need a relaxed pelvic pelvis and pelvic floor and then to maintain a curve at the back. So that's all she has to do and allow the abdomen to relax forward. Some guidelines or some societies, they also recommend that in the background, if a tap water is open, this voice of the water will further aid to the sensation of voiding urine. The same it is recommended by the RCPI uh, guidelines that the woman can have in a background, they can have a water open, which will aid further to sensation. Or just simply some patient, they can rock their uh, bottom from side to side on the commode. This will also further aid in the voiding. And some midwifery sessions, they also recommend that the patient can have gentle push on her suprapubic region in order to relieve the retention. So this all will contribute in the relief of the retention and can help her. Now coming to the <clears throat> types of the catheters which are being used for the relief of the retention in the woman. Generally, we have three types of catheter and the external catheters, they are only for male patients. Coming to the female, they can have an intermittent catheter or indwelling catheter, which we are calling as the Foley's catheter. So Foley's catheter, as we know, it has different sizes. In the woman with urinary retention, try to do a small size police catheter from 12 to 14 size that is recommended and uh, uh, if she needs indwelling catheter. But if the woman she needs just for in and out and to see the residual volume, so she will be needing an intermittent catheter which is called as a nanotin catheter. Whether it is an intermittent catheter or it is an indwelling catheter, the basic principle of catheterizing any patient is a septic technique. Because if we will not follow the septic technique, we will further contribute to ascending infection and which will have more serious consequences for our patient. So always in mind, we have to set up a sterile field. Once we have set up a sterile field, we have to perform the hand hygiene. And always it is important before examining the patient and after examining the patient to maintain the hand hygiene. The same is for catheter insertion. Always sterile surgical gloves, drapes and sponges are needed. And we have to use an appropriate antiseptic or sterile solution. And we have to use a single use packet of lubricant jelly for the catheter tip and properly cleaning of the periurethral area. In mind, we have to keep if the catheter it touches any unsterile place or even the vulva, which is not sterile part, we have to discard the catheter and have to use another sterile catheter. Most of us, uh, we know about the general principles of female catheter insertion, which is quite different from that of male. And here we have to uh, typically maintain the sterile field. So what we are doing, we are using a glove non-dominant hand. We identify the urethra by spreading the labia. 
So once we spread the inner labia slightly with gentle traction and pull upwards uh, towards the resident's head, we have to clean the periurethral area and urethral opening using antiseptic soaked swabs using our tongs and expanding circular motion. Once we have used the swabs, we have to remove it from the sterile field. Then next, we have to lubricate the tip of the catheter with steli lubricant jelly, and then to hold the coiled catheter in the dominant hand, gently introducing the catheter tip into the urethral meatus, slowly advancing the catheter to the urethra into the bladder. And remember, this is a female urethra, which is not long like a male. So don't introduce all the catheter uh, into the female bladder. If suspension resistance is met, don't force the catheter because you can, maybe the female, she has uh, any trauma to the urethra during the labor. You will further enhance or increase this trauma. So be careful, don't force the catheter. If the catheter is accidentally contaminated by touching anything, the same principle, we have to get a new one. And if the catheter, which occur mostly, sometimes the patient will move, will insert it into the vagina, discard it and get a new one. Uh, according to the new uh, the fourth article, May 2022, by the RCUG, they have uh, make a certain flow sheet for the management of the urinary incontinence in the postpartum period. So it is just straightforward, and it is a little bit different from the same society, the TOG article, which was published earlier. Some recommendations has been added. So first of all, if we have patient and she's not widening, when she's not voiding, she has delivered vaginally or the catheter has been removed after cesarean section or after the epidural anesthesia. Always keep in mind when we have to remove the catheter from the patient when she's stable and she's mobilized. Don't remove the catheter from unstable, dizzy patient or she's not mobilized because it will aid on to the urinary retention. So encourage the woman to void within four hours and support and encouragement is very really important. If she's unable to void, further two hours can be given and document the voided volume. Now the woman, she's totally unable to void. What we have to do, in and out catheter, and we have to measure the residual volume. Now this woman, she has less than 150 ml of urine. It means she doesn't have urinary retention. We have to look for other causes. The patient might have a prolonged labor and she was dehydrated. She didn't take oral fluids. She was in PPH and now she, she is hemodynamically not enough to have enough amount of output. So we have to look for other causes to hydrate, to see, and then we have to follow the void. Now we did an uh, in and out and we find that it is 150 to 250 ml. What we have to do, we have to proceed a tempo of a second void about six hours. So the same woman, we will encourage her, let her, enough drink regularly. And remember, if the woman, she's in urinary retention, don't encourage her, take this one liter of water and just try to wipe. No, she should be regularly taking little amount of water so it will aid on to relieve the retention. So our aim is to treat, not to aggravate here. So we will follow after six hours and we will see if she's voiding or no, and then accordingly for the residual volumes. Now the patient, she has residual volume of 250 to 700 ml. We have to insert an indwelling catheter for 24 hours. The guidelines in inter International Continence Society, they are recommending at least 24 hours urinary indwelling catheter for relief of any urinary retention. So at least 24 hours, and then we have to try without catheter. We have to follow the same principle. We remove the catheter, wait for four hours, encourage to void, and then again for six hours to see. And the same principle and the flow sheet will follow. Now she has residual volume of more than 700 ml. It needs catheterization for two weeks. And then she needs a follow-up. If she has persistent, of course, we need to refer this patient to the urogynecologist in order to further seek and treat any under underlying cause. If the woman here, now the same chart we are following, the right hand where the woman is unable to void it, all, uh, she has voided. Then we have to ask her about the VC questions, which we already know about the volume, empty sensation, uh, uh, sensation, emptying of the bladder, the stream and incontinence. So all these are the urinary problem questions. If these questions, they are positive, yes, 
then we have to do in and out catheter in order to see maybe she's in overt urinary retention. So here we have the covert urinary retention and here we will be coming through the covert urinary retention. So in and out was done and the woman, she has less than 250 ml. So here with the less than 250 ml, we will give her a six hours further trial and to see for the next void. If 250 to 700, again, the same principle of 24 hours. If she has more than 700 ml, the same principle of two weeks. Now the woman, she doesn't, uh, her VC question doesn't suggest anything. So we have to do a second attempt for post catheter removal. We have to give her further six hours. So again, we will see and do the same principle of in and out catheter and residual volume. So this all flow sheet follow the same principle. Now, if the woman, she is being involved in uh, the labor and she was taken epidural anesthesia. So for epidural, we have some red flag signs. So if the woman, we, the history and examination, they are suggestive that there is red flag signs for anesthesia complication. Of course, we have to involve the other specialties, radiologist, urgent anesthesia help, and to arrange for a MRI of spine. The MRI of spine suggests that the woman she has some problem there, there is problem. So anesthesia complication has occurred. So we have to refer the patient to the spinal surgery team. But if the MRI is negative and the problem is related with some uh, minor, like, so we have to follow with the obstetrician. So consultant obstetrician has to follow this patient. Now the symptoms, they were mild and they are improving. Or either the history and examination, they suggest that this is obstetrical, cause so we have to follow and she's recovering so we have to follow her until she's fully recovered but if the symptoms they are persistent or they are severe so we have to urgently seek for neurological opinion now there is no uh, guidelines about the care of the woman during labor but we should follow the general care of labor and we should encourage the woman to void every three hours in labor and depending upon her situation. And in each shift, we have to document the amount of fluid intake, fluid output and the time void and the volume void. So this is very important. Patients should not be left alone. What is our take home message from this uh, postpartum presentation is that, that we have to manage the patients with postpartum urinary retention or voiding problems in a multidisciplinary care setting and we have to anticipate the risk factors. If we can anticipate, then only we can predict. And if we can predict, we can treat. So this is very important. And we have to make early diagnosis before it is involved in the complications. Proper documentation of bladder care during labor and also postpartum. And the catheter, it should be removed in the second stage when the head is already compressing down or before any type of instrumental delivery. And if the catheter is needed to be removed, don't remove the catheter in unstable woman and who is not mobilized. And no woman after catheter removal or after a normal vaginal delivery should be allowed to go beyond six hours without voiding. Once anticipated, will be a prompt management. And important here is the patient information and education. If the patient is being informed and she knows what complications can occur, she can anticipate and come, and we can have a timely diagnosis and management. Now we have the NHS Liverpool Women's NHS Foundation Trust. There is a, a patient information leaflet. You can Google it and you can know that what is the important things we have to inform our patient. If you have it in written form or otherwise you can, yeah. So. You have to do tell the woman what is the postnatal urinary retention, why does urinary retention happen, and what happens if the woman she's unable to pass urine. We have to educate what is a catheter, okay, and how she can be helped to pass urine, and what happens if the catheter is being removed when she should void, and what happens if she cannot pass urine after the catheter is being removed? And she should be educated. If she has a problem, this problem can recur again or no in the next pregnancy and postpartum period. Thank you all.
for your patience and these are the references. I hope the presentation was interesting and knowledgeable.